Welcome to On The Bubble Podcast Episode 3. I'm your host, Tsubasa J. Ueda, and with me is my co-host, Yuki Lee Bender. Similar to last week, we'll be doing a deep dive into one hero, and today we'll be talking about Phi. We're going to go over his general game plan, key cards, how to play against each hero in the format, and finally, the deck outline. But before all of that, how was your week, Yuki? My week's been pretty good. Um, classic Constructed and draft testing for a pro tour has like really been picking up for me so just been spending a lot of time uh testing and yeah just trying to figure out what to play for pt that's been more or less what i've been up to ah that's good that's good how about you Trey? yeah for myself uh i think the only fab i played was the triple draft we went to together at infinity cards they're actually a great store. They host a draft, I think, once every two weeks-ish. And instead of doing one draft, we do multiple drafts. And this week we did three, which was Uprising, Monarch, then Uprising. Uh, we're not going to talk much about Monarch, but the Uprising drafts were pretty sweet for me. I actually ended up going 2-1 in the first draft and 3-0 in the, in the third draft, technically. But... Uh, because there was 10 people in the pod, I got second place going 3-0. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did not do fantastic those drafts. I think I had a 2-1 draw my deck and then a 1-2 Icelander deck. Um, but yeah, I thought I thought I wound up in decent decks, just didn't quite get there in some of the games and played against some like pretty good decks. So I wasn't too upset with it, but it wasn't the best either. Okay, okay. Oh, well, let's move on to the question of the week. Uh, thank you for everyone who submitted questions via Twitter. This was almost two weeks ago now. And it's from Michael Sinopolis. And it says, if you have played any other limited formats on other games, how does FAD compare? And what should we th- be thinking differently in this game? Yeah, so both Jay and I come from playing Limited and Magic the Gathering. Um, and I think that's probably like the big other game that I th- that comes to mind when you think of like really big limited formats. So um, in terms of Magic, one of the big differences is that because um, outside of the generics and maybe like some of the um, some of the like talented cards, if they're shared, there's really not that much room to like pivot and and stay open and kind of draft different things. Um, you, you can't really do that for very long in FAB. Um, also because you have to play 30 of the cards, you have to draft a 30 card deck, um, whereas Magic, you're playing 23 of your of your cards. So um, in addition to needing to play more of your picks, you also just kind of, um, your, your picks are not as flexible. You don't get to pull from two different pools. It all has to go in the same hero. And, and ultimately you can kind of burn about four or five cards is is what we said last time because you want to draft some equipment there's going to be a few cards that you're going to not be able to draft uh um like you're not gonna be able to get the class that you want and then um yeah so so between that and the couple picks that you burn in the equipment that's probably about like your 12 cards from the 42 any thoughts jay yeah so comparing it to magic the biggest difference is definitely the num- the percentage of cards you have to play in fab where fab for 42 30 out of 42 and equipment so like around 33 of 42 that's like 75% of your picks and a magic 23 of 45 is 50% of your picks it just means that you have to be committing to a to a plan earlier and so there's less flexibility in fab but there are flexibility in the sense that because there's only three heroes and you're sh- going to be having to share it with other people, you're going to have a bigger edge, I think, in this game. Be able to notice and correctly pick the best cards from each class, essentially. So like, if you're in Phi, if you can identify the better Phi cards um that you want over other people i think it's going to give you a huge edge in this game at least for now before you know hopefully people listen to our podcast and uh we correctly identify the good cards and hopefully we don't have any huge misses on our podcast but maybe you might later 
or even now we don't know yet but <laughs> hopefully we don't butcher any cards you want to go to the main topic yeah let's move on to our main topic so for our main topic we're going to be talking everything five today so we're going to go back same as last week in our draft pod i think we're supposed to have about three to five five still which means you have to be sharing this class with other people on the draft pod. And it's going to be very important in this format because unlike Icelander or Dromai, where you may be either alone or sharing it with maybe one, at most two other people, Fi, you're going to be sharing this hero with at least three people on your pod. Um, and if you ever get into a pod where you're the only Fi player, it's probably very 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 good for you what do you think yeah i tend to agree if you're the only five the the other decks are are not going to be particularly good because icelander and dromai will be so overdrafted and then you'll of course have a great deck um but yeah i, I tend to agree i think i think five is quite strong when there's three or four when it does get up to five um the five decks get pretty weak but but i've definitely seen five fives in a pod before um but like four i've seen like five versus five finals so i think at four or five is still like really really solid yeah so yuki why is Fi so why is there so many Fi drafters in each pod yeah so the big thing with Fi is that because there's so much redundancy um in his cards like he has a bunch of different head jabs which are the three for zeros leg taps which are the four for ones and surgings Surging Strikes, which are the five for T's. There, there's different ones with different names, and and some of them have a little bit of like circumstantial text on them, and we'll talk about each of them, but but mostly they're interchangeable. Um, and also none of his cards are are really bad per se. Um, there is the rapid reflex, the attack reaction, which is not great, but it's also still totally serviceable. It blocks for three, it can close out a game unexpectedly, and um yeah like the blue one is just super solid as a blue block three so phi ends up with like all of his cards just being really good like there's not really a phi card that you're sad to see and because of that he tends to just support a lot of players because there's going to be so many of the cards you need going around the table that you can't really get completely cut out of them and um like basically all the phi cards that get opened are playable whereas i don't think that's the case for Icelander or for Dromai, they both have some like fairly lousy cards, like Read the Ripples and Icelander is quite poor. Um and Dromai has like like the blue sand covers and yellow sand covers. Even the even the reds are just like not fantastic. Yeah, I think so too. So I'm just gonna go over how many of each uh different variants of head jab like taps there are. So in Fi at Common, uh for the head jabs, we have Brand with Cinderclaw. Rising Resentment and Ronin, uh, Ronin Renegade. All three of them are at common, and they're all the zero cost three damage go again. Uh, and it does have also Lava Vein Loyalty as well, which is a uh, it's not it doesn't have go again naturally, but it can gain go again uh, if you've played another Draconic card. Uh, this chain link. And at Mythic, there's also Phoenix Form, which is like a pseudo 0 for 3 with Go Again, if you have played a Phoenix Flame this turn. And it's not too hard to do that as Phi with its uh, hero ability. For Leg Taps, uh, we have three so-and-so commons and one rare, one majestic, which is the Soaring Sight, Dust Runner, Outlaw, and Flame Call Awakening for the commons, which does one cost for four damage with Go Again. And Mounting Anger at Rare, which does 4 damage with Go Again. We'll talk about that card a little bit more later. And Spreading Flames essentially does at least 4 for 1 as well. So I'm going to count that as a light tap here as well. And then the 2 cost for 5 is a little bit more rare. But honestly, I, we, I don't think it's that good. Um, it's a Rebellious Rust and Engulfing Flame Wave. 1 at Common, 1 at Rare. And that's the 2 for 5 with Go Again. Right. So, yeah, I, I think echoing what Jay said, I think that the two for fives are the least desirable because um, five's weapon, Searing Ember Blade, is just so efficient. The two cost, three power attack with Go Again. 
is just really, really solid. And it often reduces the cost of the Phoenix Flame to make that f- free. So sometimes it's almost like a two for four, um, which is pretty crazy, uh, honestly. It's just so good that you basically want to be doing that every turn. But if you have a two cost, you you cannot just pitch a blue and two cost into the weapon. You, you kind of need to... Um, you know, have like multiple blues or pitch, you have to pitch two cards. So you actually lose quite a bit there. And I think they tend to be by far the weakest. Yeah. So I think the best, best plan with Phi would be to pitch a blue. You want to attack with either a head jab or a leg tap, and then follow that up with an ember blade, which then gives it go again. Then you want to play at zero cost uh, with, then activate Fi's hero ability to get the Phoenix Flame back to add the extra damage on there. So that's like the cookie cutter, um, like the best play you can do is just one cost, Ember Blade, zero cost, and then Fi's ability for the Phoenix Flame. And if you can just do that every single turn, you can generate a lot more damage than basically any other hero in this format at a very consistent rate because all of these cards are are at common and there's multiple different versions of them. Yeah. Um, the other thing you can add on is also the, the finishers to the end of those turns. Um, they're not as high priority as the starters because you can still do very good damage with just starters and um, they're just more consistent. Like you can never draw a hand that doesn't function with the starters. However, the finishers really do kind of like let you go over the top and just do like that little bit of extra damage where the turns start getting really scary and you start getting to like the 16 to 20 damage range. Um, so cards like Lava Burst in particular is really good, the five for zero, but even like Stoke the Flames um, as a pseudo five for one, uh, Searing Touch or or Critical Strike are, are reasonable enders um, that can make your turn pretty strong just keep in mind that if you have a lot of the um the one cost enders you probably want to be having more zero cost starters so that you can still do like the zero cost ember blade and uh another card phoenix flame ender kind of thing like so you can pitch the two and the one for the blade and the and the finisher um if you have too many one cost and one cost enders um it'll it'll start to feel kind of clunky yeah, I agree with that. I think the more lava bursts you have, the more one cost starters you want, and the more uh, searing touch uh, or breaking points you have, you want more zero cost uh, starters. So you do want to be able to play all cards in your hand by pitching one blue. That's typically its most powerful turns. So if you have more copies of Stoke the Flame, Critical Strike, Searing Touch, all of those, you just want all of the Ronin Renegades and the uh, Rising Resentments. Okay, so let's move on to which cards are priorities in Fi. So what key cards are you looking for to basically get into the deck? Yeah, so I think that the number one thing that I'm looking for in Fi is um, actually the equipment. I think that they are the most powerful cards in the deck by a lot. Um, and that's just because we just talked about how Fi cards are so redundant and all do very much a similar thing. So because of that, you can't... It, like, like, yes, if you have a Mounting Anger instead of a Soaring Strike with a slightly better on hit, it makes your deck a little bit better. But it's hard to get that much stronger than just having like the right mix of cards at the right pitches. Um, but the equipment and starting with them in play is is very powerful and, and can kind of elevate your deck to the next level. So um, in particular, we think that Heat Wave is really good. That's the uh, Quell 1 arms, and you can break it to make your Phoenix Flames uh, deal one more damage until end of turn. Um, it's pretty easy for Heat Wave just to be worth two damage. Um, you just wait until you have a double Phoenix Flame turn, if your deck can do that, um, and then you'll you'll get free two damage. Um, one damage is super trivial. You'll, you'll get it for sure. So Heat Wave is just like very solid way to just add to your turns. Um, and sometimes it's even a plus three, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and then finally, like Sasha Sandakai uh, is also super, super important. Um, 
yeah, the extra resource can sometimes just, even if you do wind up having that like one cost plus one cost opener plus one cost finisher, which would normally need free re- uh, four resources, the sash can sometimes just let you do that turn anyways, which is, you know, it can be worth, again, like like four damage almost um, sometimes. Um, so it kind of depends. Yeah, so talking about Tide Flippers next, that's the uh, leg piece for ninjas. Tide Flipper is the AB1 equipment for ninjas, and it does also have the attack reaction to destroy it to give a card with base power to go again. So this doesn't it doesn't mean that the card has to be attacking for two at that point. It just has to have a printed uh, number two on the bottom left-hand corner. So the most iconic card to pair this card with would be Lava Burst. So if you have to either put Lava Burst in the middle of your chain or um, at the very beginning, you can give Lava Burst go again, even if it is attacking for 5 because its base power is still 2. And that can push a lot of damage. And in turns where you essentially brick or don't have any starters, you can turn a Lava Burst into a starter, which is like a get out of free jail card, which is... Get out of get out of jail free card. Wow. Okay. Yeah, just to, just to add on with the tide flippers. If you if you ever get to it doesn't come up very often, but if you ever get to double finisher because you do like a lava burst, give it go again, and then do any of the other finishers, like you do like a crit, a critical strike for five at the end or something, it it's actually just pretty much game winning um so it can unlock these like really crazy lines that will like probably involve sash of sandakai as well but are just extremely powerful so something to look out for yeah these equipments are very vital in going over the top of just basically all the decks in the format the next card i just want to talk about would be mounting anger uh this is the only version of the leg tap so the one cost four damage at red that generates an on hit that is more important than all of the other ones um having mounting anger oh sorry before that i'm gonna just explain what mounting anger does okay so mounting anger reads when mounting anger hits you may banish an attack action card from your hand with costs less than the number of draconic chain links you control And if you do, it gains plus one, and you may play it this turn. So the plus one on the Mounting Anger essentially makes this card a one for five with natural go again, uh, or it forces your opponent to block. Uh, We're going to be talking about the five matchup a little bit later as well, but when your cards start attacking for five, while theirs only attack for four in the mirror, you're going to get a little bit of an edge here, and every edge matters in a mirror match. So Mounting Anger is the one cost four damage uh, attack action that you want in your deck. Anything to add to that? I think that's the big thing. Um, I think that more or less like summarizes it. The, so yeah, you really want the starters you in general, but like Mounting Anger stands out, but like pretty much just like starters in general are really good. I guess a question that maybe comes up here, Jay, is how do we value the um, the finishers? Like when you're drafting your deck, how high of a priority pick are those chain enders for you? For myself, I'm not too worried about the chain enders. I'm more scared, at least for myself, to make sure I have enough starters because I am going to be fighting for them and... Typically, the red ones in general are going to be higher value to me. I'm going to be looking to pick those up before the uh, finishers, just because there's already there's also a re- like a very high density of good draconic finishers already. Uh, that I think I want to have a higher density of starters than the finishers, so I'm going to be picking the starters first before the finishers. That's how I approach this format. What about you, Yuki? Yeah, I generally agree. Um, For the most part, I'm going to prioritize the red starters, um, especially the three and the three and four power ones. I think the one exception maybe for me though is lava burst. I think that lava burst being zero cost 
for five is just, it makes it so flexible because it works. Even if you pair it with a zero cost starter, it, it makes your turn much more powerful. So it works with a zero cost or a one cost, which is really nice, just that flexibility. Um, so I think that that card, if it's early in the draft, I'm willing to prioritize it pretty highly just so that I have it in my deck. But if it's mid draft and I like know that I'm fi and I'm kind of low on starters, I would you know take a starter over it. So it kind of depends where I'm at in my draft. But like I think that early on you can you can pick it quite highly um, just because having one or two in your deck is a, a pretty big deal. I think. Yeah, that sounds sounds pretty reasonable. Okay, then let's move on to uh, cards you don't want to have in fi. Uh, so cards that may look good in five but are not good maybe cards you should avoid picking at least early so the the card that we should definitely never play um it's come up in a lot of our car rides back uh, from drafts and stuff is in flame uh this card is a zero cost for one damage with go again so it can be a pseudo starter but you get to add a Phoenix Flame from your graveyard to your hand. Why is this card bad, Yuki? The rate on it is just really, really poor. Um, if you're ever playing it as a one for zero as your chain starter, it just feels really, really bad. Like it's basically doing what like a a blue would do, except it still only pitches for one and blocks for two. Um, and even if you do the thing where you start with a red card and then you play this and you get you get the bonus, it's still only two damage for a red, which is already below rate. That's like a yellow, like a yellow head jab is two for zero, right? And it pitches two. So while in flame is arguably better than a Phoenix Flame, uh, it, it's better except that it doesn't have the Phoenix Flame synergies. But that's kind of about it. It's like a slight upgrade sort of to Phoenix Flame, which is not really considering you get phoenix flames as a token that's not really how you want to be spending your picks yeah just picking a in flame uh instead of and like playing that over phoenix flame just seems not great so i would avoid this card another thing i just want to add about in flame is uh for fi's ability to be very useful you do need to have a phoenix flame in your graveyard and when you play in flame it takes that phoenix flame out of your graveyard which means you can't activate Fi's ability anymore unless you have a second Phoenix Flame, which isn't always there, and you have to work for it. You have to work to get a second Phoenix Flame in your graveyard. And when you have to work this hard to do two damage for a card, it is not worth it. At least for a red card, it is not worth it. Yeah. Okay, then next card is Red Hot. Red Hot is the 2 cost 4 damage finisher for Draconic. Uh, when you play it as a chain link 4 or greater, uh, you get to do damage equal to... You can flip over cards from the top of your deck equal to the number of Draconic chain links. Why is this card not that good? Red Hot can do a lot of damage um, and can like kind of surprise close out of the game because you can't really stop the uh, damage from the, from the triggered ability. But the cost on it is just really, really awkward. The two cost. We already talked about how two cost starters are tough to play because they don't fit into your resource curve of Ember Blade um, and play this thing. So, so this has that problem, but it's even worse because it's not even a starter. You have to get to the end of the chain and and and, and chain link four too. And then you get to do the thing. Like it's just not. It's just too hard to play. Yeah, I think it is too hard to play. And even if you do get to play it, when you you flip over three, maybe four cards, not all of those cards are going to be red cards. You flip over. So if half of it is red, you do six damage total, including the four that it naturally attacks for. And the two for six is good, but like brother in arms is two for six. And you can just play that if you really want a finisher at two cost. So it's not worth getting up to the rupture for Red Hot. Uh, and you'd rather prioritize better finishers. And as we said every time, Lava Burst is probably the best one you can get to. 
Okay, uh, what do you think about Cinder, Cinder Skin Devotion? This is the one cost for four with go again if you've played a Draconic card this turn. Or if, if you had a Draconic Chain Link, it gets go again. Yeah, it, it's okay. Um, this one does block three since it's not just like a natural go again. So it's kind of it's like upside. But I think the problem with it is that it sort of... You can only play it efficiently if you have a zero cost starter, because if you ever, if you ever have to um, like do a one cost starter and then you want to try and play Cinder Skin Devotion, it's really really awkward because if you do play it, you've now used two of your pitch and you can't swing Ember Blade. So you've kind of lost out on three damage. So in a sense, Cinder Skin Devotion is really only dealing like one more damage than your Ember Blade in that scenario. And like, yeah, you can block with it for three. So that's like, it, it makes it not quite so bad. Um, unless it's the Icelander matchup, then it still sucks. But um, yeah, it, it's not great. Yeah, this card has some efficiency problems in trying to deal damage, so it ends up being a block card more often than not. So if you treat this card like a 1 cost 4 damage spell, you're going to come into a little bit of issues or troubles with continuing your turn. Okay, then let's move on to some of the Majestics. Uh, we've talked about Spreading Flames already as a leg tap. Is this card good in in draft? I think it's pretty good. Um, it's not like a crazy bomb or anything. You don't need to go nuts about it. I'd probably... Mm, you know, it, it might be one of the better starters. Like, I'd probably take a Mounting Anger over it. I don't know if I would take a zero-cost uh, starter over it. I might take Spreading Flames. Um, but yeah, it's basically a leg tap because you Phoenix Flame most turns. And Phoenix Flame with Spreading Flames is is like four damage because it adds one to the Phoenix Flame. The thing is, though, that Spreading Flames, it's it's fairly doable to actually uh, buff two things. And if you ever do that, and this is representing five damage for one resource, it's actually pretty good. So I wouldn't say it's like a crazy bomb or anything, but I think that the card is like above average for sure. Yeah. I think the one issue is that spreading fames, you gotta work for the five damage, whereas mounting anger it just presents five damage if it hits. So basically the difference would be mounting anger, you just play it and it presents five damage. Spreading flames, you have to work for the fifth damage. And obviously when you get to the six damage or even the miracle seven damage, uh it gets pretty insane. But that's um it's quite rare or hard to do in the limited format. Okay, so next card we're going to talk about is Take the Tempo. Is this card playable? I mean, it's definitely playable. Um, just the stat line of 1 for 5, as it's like the finishers. like It's like a critical strike or a breaking point. Um, I consider like breaking point and critical strike pretty interchangeable. Yeah, breaking point has like the rupture uh, command and conquer effect, but um, kind of doesn't matter that much. Um, I think Take the Tempo, though, probably has like the best on hit out of all of them. Getting to banish the top card of your deck, and if it's an attack action, which because you're Fi, it probably is, um, is pretty strong. Like It's, it's kind of like draw a card and save it for next turn. Um, or like plus one intellect almost is like what it's like. So I think it's definitely a good card, but like it's a finisher. Like it's like a premium finisher. Um, if you need starters, then you know I prioritize those starters. But early in a draft, would I take it? Yeah, maybe. It's a pretty strong finisher. It might be close to lava burst. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's the uh, best one cost for five uh, in the set. So as an M, it's pretty good. But still, starters are a little bit more important. Okay, then next card we're going to be talking about is Uprising, like the name of the set. So this card is a zero cost, uh, and it buffs the next four Draconic cards by one power. Uh, how good is this card? Um, it's not great. The The big problem is that, so 
at its best, if you buff four attacks with it, it's a zero for four, which is pretty good. But the problem is, is that you need to actually have four other attacks to buff. Um, and this doesn't give you a chain link. So it's not even like a starter. You have to have played a starter and then play this and then try and get four other things. Oh, you can't actually you can't actually play a starter and then play uprising. You have to be uprising and then a starter. Sorry, you're right, you're right. But I mean sorry, you have to play that then Ember Blade, then like Phoenix Flame. So it's like very hard. Like it it just like eats a card out of like what would be a chain. So yeah, I think it's just like a little bit too hard. Like in general, the cards for Fi that don't generate chain links are not that good because you get so many benefits for generating chain links, like turning on Rupture and and getting the free Phoenix Flame. That um, not doing that is like a pretty big cost. Yeah, the, I think the only good thing about Uprising is that it can block for three. Other than that, it's not really playable, so maybe it might be a little bit better than a bobble. But typically, it's pretty hard to attack three times with after playing Uprising. So I just wouldn't think about playing Uprising ever in a deck. If it comes 15th pick, I'll pick it for the dollar. You know, it's worth a dollar. Might be worth a little bit more, actually. Maybe. I don't know if it's seeing too much play in Constructed right now. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Okay, next card we want to talk about is Liquidif- <sighs> Liquidify. Liquidify? Liquidify. How do yeah. I pronounce this card? Yeah, Liquidify. 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 There you go. That sounds better. Okay, do um, you want to explain the card and if it's playable or not? Yeah, so I'm going to be honest. I don't know the exact card text on this. It's, it's the attack reaction that lets you... It's the attack reaction that lets you melt their armor if you have rupture. But the problem is, is that, like, I, I believe it costs one. Correct. It's just not doing enough. Like, the, like in CC, you have some very good equipment. But the draft equipment, like, as much as we say they're high picks, you liquidify, like, spending an entire card to liquidify one of their equipment is not a particularly good deal. And you have to work for it to do that. It costs one and you need rupture. Like that's a really, it's like hard to do. And then even when you do the thing, I don't even think of it as a good deal. Like a lot of the equipment are worth like, we talked about how like heat waves worth like two damage, right? But if you're trading, you're working this hard to trade a card for like two damage. It's kind of, it's not very good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of unplayable. I would... This card is one of those cards that would almost never make my deck. I would I would just ignore it completely. I would almost rather play a bubble over it. Actually, yeah, I think Yeah, so. I think I would I would play a bubble over it, right? Yeah, I I think I would. Um it just pitches for more resources and I guess this card blocks, but Fi is not your game plan is not really blocking. So, I I just yeah. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. The bubble just turns into your Ember Blade, which is like, yeah, maybe you miss the Phoenix Flame or like the one cost, um, but it's still pretty good. Fair enough. Okay, enough about Liquidify. We're going to talk about Double Strike next. So this is going to be the last time we talk about. And how good is Double Strike? This one seems promising. Um, it's not great. It has a few problems. The first off is just the rate on it, the two attacks for one. Um, is like two damage for one card, um, which again is kind of like a yellow's damage output. I, I guess it's a little bit harder to block, which can be relevant in the very, very late game. Although Quell makes it a little bit less relevant than it usually is. Like you can pretty easily Quell this card. Um, and then the other really big problem with this card that makes it, that's like probably what really seals the deal on it is that it's not draconic. So it doesn't turn on um, it doesn't count towards your hero ability, and it also doesn't turn on your Ember Blade or like your Lava Vein loyalties, for example. Um, it does make Rupture, so even though it gets banished and then you play it again, it does count for two link two chain links for Rupture. So I guess that's something. But yeah, the the rate on it's not good. Not being not being draconic is not good. Um, you could put it in your deck, but it's it's not exciting. Yeah, I agree with that. It's uh, 
Double Strike has a lot of typing issues, and it's going to not deal enough damage. Like you can just play any yellow zero cost, and it almost serves your deck better because you can pitch the yellow, you can attack with the yellow, and it has a draconic typing, so it essentially gets plus plus one from Fi's ability if you can get the three draconic cards. And Double Strike just doesn't help in any of that form and only pitches for red, so I think this card's unplayable. Uh, maybe not unplayable, but pretty bad. Yeah, I, I would play it over a bobble, but... Um, it's getting close. Yeah, I might play Phoenix Flames over it, depending on how many um, how many like of the cares about Phoenix Flame cards I have. Um, I might play the Phoenix Flame over it, but if I didn't have very many of those and I wanted to just run like the no Phoenix Flame flag, yeah, Double Strike's a little better than a Phoenix Flame for sure. Okay, so I think that's all the Majestics we wanted to mention. So next we're going to talk about the game plan against each hero. Uh, so let's first talk about game plan against Dromai. And let's start this question off with first or second. If you win the die roll as Phi, do you want to go first or do you want to go second? Uh, you definitely want to go second. And I think that this is just consistent trend for Phi. And actually, honestly, most of the format, I think. But um, but yeah, for Phi, you want to go second. Um, against Dromai, you tend to be more efficient than her. Her best hands are can actually be even higher efficiency than yours. Like if she has the centipies, they're they're above rate. And if you don't have Popper, she will outvalue you. But the thing is, is there's not that many of the centipies and she's not that likely to see them. So on average, you're far more um, threatening than she is. And if you just get to like hit her hard and get ahead early, it's really hard for her to ever really like keep up with you and and pressure you back. Um, the, the games are significantly harder for Dromai when she has to go um, when Fi gets to go second because of that just like initial pressure and then like Dromai's like hard pressed to get Ash and then you know has to like slowly turn the corner. It's it's quite tough. And let's talk about Dromai's dragons, mostly the Aether Ash Wings. So Aether Ash Wings are the uh, is the token ally that uh, one health, one power. How do we deal with these Ash Wings when Dromai plays them? Yeah, so it sort of depends. Generally, you want to um, you want to kill them, uh, particularly with like the Phoenix Flame. I wouldn't. Or, or if you have to like play like a blue blue starter or something, um, you can do that. Like a blue head jab you, for what you can you can poke it. But usually it's with the the phoenix flame. That being said, um, it is sometimes correct to ignore them if there's too many and you're at this point of the game where you are able to, like if they have like four of them, but they're low enough that you're able to take. Um, their whole hand pretty consistently, then it is it is time to start ignoring them, and you can actually kind of lose the game from attacking them. But um, in general, you usually want to poke them. Like in the early game, it's, it's usually good to poke them down with the Phoenix Flame. Yeah, you want to poke down the Ash Wings with your Phoenix Flame. Uh, what about the bigger dragons? How do you how do you do you have to kill those ones? Usually, um, it kind of depends how much damage they would do. So the more damage that the dragon does, the higher priority it is. Something like Uvia is actually very, very low priority against Fi. I think you can just ignore it. It has six health, so it's really hard to kill. And then it also only attacks for one, so it's pretty ignorable. And because you're pressuring Dromai so hard, it's she, she doesn't get very many opportunities to make Ash efficiently. And... Uvia is not really going to get like multiple Ash Wings on the board. So, um, yeah, usually you want to kill them, but it depends on how um, how hard they are to kill for you and also how much damage they're representing, higher damage, higher priority. Um, and just a note that the dragons do trigger your on hits, and in particular, Stoke the Flames is really nice into dragons because you can... Like the four damage kills most of the dragons, and then you just get a free Phoenix Flame that you can, I don't know, kill an extra Ash Wing or poke them for one with. It's just pretty good value. Yeah, so most of Fi's cards is when this card hits, uh, you get to do an ability, and all of those hits will trigger off of hitting a dragon. So if you do have an on hit that's especially good, 
uh, even like mounting anger. Uh, you do want to use the mounting anger to hit the dragon and then banish the card to get the plus one on your next attack. It is a free way to get out, get the on hits. So if you have any on hits that you care about, it's a good place to use it. I think one other thing that you want against Dromai would be poppers. So poppers are just six power non um, non illusionist cards uh, that can pop phantasm cards. And every dragon in Dromai has phantasm uh, because of the ash that it's under. Sorry, that the ash is under the dragons, which gives the dragons phantasm. It's not written on the card, uh, so sometimes people may forget. But remember, every dragon, every dragon ally has phantasm on it. So if you have like a red brother in arms, this is a place you want to side it in. Or if you have like Fendels, uh, the yellow or the red one that has six or seven power, you want to bring that in to make sure you can pop these dragons. And any turn you get to pop a big dragon, it's big game. That that swings the game so hard in your favor that Droma can almost never come back. Like you have two poppers and you pop two dragons, it's it's very hard for Dromai to come back from that. Sometimes even popping an Ashwing can be worth it, in particular if they have multiple Ashwings. Like if they have like three Ashwings or more, let's say, or like sometimes even two. Um, if you're not really able to play that popper efficiently in your turn, which in your hand, which you probably aren't because you want to Ember Blade, it's totally fine to just like pop their Ashwing and then save an extra like two to three life or something. Um, pretty good. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, you have a note that says Life Threshold. What is this? Yeah, so I thought one of the things that we should talk about for each of the heroes is what is sort of the life threshold in which you are kind of in danger from Dromai and you might have to start like thinking about um, having cards ripped from your hand. Um, like, Is there like a critical life point where you like are likely to have to block against Dromai? What kind of life total is that? Oh, I see, I see. So I think against Dromai, I think you do want to be above four for sure, just because a lot of Dromai's strong plays revolves around playing a red first, including Dust Up or Miraging, Bellowing Mirage, uh, which is a one for three go again that makes an Ashwing. So all of those cards essentially attack you for four uh, with one card, which means that you want to be, if you're at five, you can ignore that turn and go and then go back at them uh, going down to one. But anytime if you're below four or at four or lower, you do have the risk of needing to block. What do you think, Yuki? Yeah, uh, certainly like once you are below four, pretty much any card that they keep represents a card getting ripped from your hand. Um, and also sort of like another breakpoint would be maybe around like the like seven to eight life mark where um, an Ember Maw Cinepi can present like seven or eight damage if it's yellow or red. Um, once you dip to those life totals, just understand that if you give them an opportunity to keep a two card hand, including just one in arsenal plus a card in hand to pitch, um, they can sometimes like rip a card from your hand and, and claw back pretty hard. So yeah, just sometimes like keeping yourself kind of at like the 10 life mark as Phi makes it much safer against Dromai and makes it so that you kind of have like an extra turn before you're going to like they have to hit you up like for two turns almost or, or keep a hand and hit you with a, a bigger hand in order to make you block. Um, yeah. Yeah, Dromai's goal in this matchup is to rip cards out of Fi's hand so then they're forced to block. So you do want to try and be, when you do have the three blocks in your hand, uh, you do want to try and use those to keep your life points healthy enough so then when they do try and pressure you, you can... Um, you have the life padding to essentially keep your hand and go back at them so they can't come at you twice two turns in a row yeah like a like a good example is if you have like a yellow like especially if it's like a yellow brother in arms that like blocks three or does two damage um depending on the life totals you might be better off just like blocking three and staying healthy than just like trying to get in for the two damage because 
you want to pressure them like like staying out of those kind of critical ranges so like above above eight or above four are kind of like the two break points um yeah you, you probably should try and prioritize that over like mediocre damage yeah sounds great okay let's move on to icelander so what are we doing against icelander first or second i think you definitely want to go second um Particularly if you have the Tide Flippers, because between even though Icelander can deal arcane damage, you can use Helios Miter in combination with Tide Flippers, and um, you can prevent quite a bit of arcane. Remember that they're pretty likely to follow up with Waning Moon, so you probably want to budget for two arcane barriers and then the rest into Miters divide up on the attacks. But they're they're really not going to be able to chip you that much. And even if they give you Frostbites with like an Arctic Incarceration, you can actually still um, pitch to Miter naming their Ember Blade, even though they're not attacking with it. Or sorry, not their Ember Blade, their Waning Moon, even though they're not attacking with it, and, and break those Frostbites. So... Um, yeah, she can't really threaten you that much going first. And then once again, like Phi just wants to be the aggressor. And what I find about the Phi versus Icelander matchup is that like one of the big ways that Phi wins is if Icelander doesn't really have that much disruption on the first turn and Phi just gets to attack her for like 12 or something. Like it's it's really it's quite challenging for Icelander because she kind of like can't really do that much and it's probably like leaking some damage and yeah if she just gets hit really hard right out of the gates it's it's quite it's quite tricky for her to win yeah i send her starting at 18 life um Phi has an easier time pressuring the the icelander so you just want to come at come out of the gates hard and hit them when you can because not every turn you do have you don't have the luxury to hit them because my is going to try and make frostbites and disrupt you as much as possible Okay, and uh, what am I looking to sideboard against Icelander with Phi? So the biggest thing is like some extra blues. I'd say in like your standard Phi deck, we'll talk about the outline, but in the standard Phi deck, I'd probably want about like eight to nine blues, maybe ten if I have a, like a lot of the expensive cards, like multiple um, like surging strikes and stuff like that. Then I might go up to like ten. But um, for Icelander specifically, I would board up to maybe about um, twelve or so blues, uh, I'd play pretty happily. Um, even if they're really junky ones, like your blue healing bombs or like your blue, like blue oasis respite, actually very good against Icelander. Remember, she's not going to be really sending attacks at you. So um, the, the, the pitch value is really what you care about. And it lets you not only mitigate some damage with Arcane Barrier, but um, it lets you play through some of the disruption and, and frostbites as well. Um, so yeah, the, the blues are quite good. Yeah, another card that you want to be playing or at least prioritize during the draft would be Tide Flippers. Without Tide Flippers, this matchup can be pretty bad for Fi, as Icelander can just do keep on doing chip damage and keep on presenting Frostbites to really make your, each of your turns expensive. And Icelander has a lot of three blocks, so once it does, once Icelander gets going at putting a good amount of disruption and a little bit of arcane damage uh, and putting the pressure on, you might be in a situation where you do need that AB1 uh, each turn. And without Tide Flippers, the Icelanders can run away with the game with one uh, arc taking incarceration. Any other cards other than Tide Flippers that would be good against them? Um, Oasis Respite is is really solid i mentioned the blue one because it's also a blue but just having the ability to prevent damage is strong the reds and yellows are are good as well um i actually had a game just recently that i lost to fi even though i thought that my icelander deck was quite good um i, I ended up losing to this Fi player because um like both of my turns where i tried to set up and just like do a whole bunch of damage, like do like prevent like five to seven damage or like do a fused ether ice vein. They just had the oasis respite and then like would, you know, um, pitch a blue oasis um, and then AB2 um, and just like not really take any damage and then just come back at me for um, 
you know, just like a three card hand or like a two card hand, do like a three, three, one, like a head jab into Ember Blade into Phoenix Flame or something. Um, and just like kind of punishing me for taking damage. So Oasis just, yeah, very, very powerful card. Um, can really kind of, Iceland is really trying to like gauge how many turns she is away from killing you and just being able to change that by a turn, it makes a huge difference. That's fair. Then what about Healing Bomb or like the mostly the red ones? We already talked about the blue ones as a pitch is pretty good, but what about the red Healing Bombs? Is that card good against Icelander? It's okay. Um, if you have some like pretty mediocre cards, I might consider Healing Bomb over them. Um, it's like. Like, yeah, it might be better than your one cost enders because like you might be getting a frostbite, so the one costs get more more awkward. Um, so like maybe this is a slightly better one cost ender. But in general, um, even though like the life buffer is quite good, and if you're like going first, um, gaining the life on turn zero is really nice. I think in general I'd rather be pressuring the Icelander and sometimes just like the as Fi, I think you're wanting to make the game go as fast as possible. And like the more turns you give Icelander to do her thing and set up and find her tempo cards and start taking over the game, like the harder the game's gonna get. So while Oasis like stops like a really big chunk and is very efficient because it's so much damage, healing bombs and like this kind of middle ground where it often doesn't necessarily put you out of range enough and it just also doesn't pressure. Yeah, that sounds fair. Then let's move on to life threshold. What's the life threshold you're looking to maintain as Phi? Yeah, so it kind of depends on your quell and um, your quell and your um, AB situation. Do you have tide flippers? Um, the more, if you do have AB, you can kind of figure the kind of the most damage they can do is like a five plus a two for seven, and then. Um, three plus two for five maybe realistically like one of those will be like a four or like they'll have like only the one the one power on your turn but they could even have like a like an ice bolt honestly so so yeah maybe like around like 12 ish if they're able to keep a hand and just do damage and you don't have any ab is about 12 if you have ab um if you have AB as well, you figure you can stop two damage on each of those turns. That'd be kind of like eight um, or like sub eight. Like if once you start getting to like seven, you're you're pretty dangerous if she gets to keep cards on her turn because she can probably kill you over the course of like her turn, then your turn. Um, or sometimes even like the current turn, your turn, and then her turn. If you haven't seen what she's done yet, then it, you know that, that threshold can go up even a little bit more. So that's a lot of life difference just ha just having tie flippers and not having tight flippers how important do you think tie flippers is like if you don't have a tie flippers and you got paired against a ice sender how like scared are you it's pretty scary like i i hope that i can just hit them really 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 hard or maybe like i have like a red oasis and i hope that i just line that up on a good turn when when they're trying to like come in for the kill and then you deny them the kill and and then they can't win anymore. Um, but yeah, the, the tide flippers are huge, just giving you that like extra life buffer because otherwise, yeah, you can like sometimes even like at 15, you're kind of in the danger zone if you can't rip at least one card from hand because if it's your turn and she waning moons you for three and then does five plus two and then does like two plus two plus three on the next turn that's you're, you're dead you know um or very close to dead you have to like start pitching into helios miter which is pretty bad for you so yeah pretty scary without tide flippers okay then let's talk about the phi mirror so again question first or second um as always i think going second um yeah, just being the one to hit them first and, and force cards out of hand is is always Phi's game plan. And it's especially so because the Phi deck blocks so poorly that they just kind of have to eat it and then they hit you back. And unless they can hit you for 20, which sometimes they can actually, but unless they can do that, it can be 
it can sometimes be very hard, um, especially depending how good your turn is uh, when you're going second. Yeah, I just want to quickly talk about when you have to go first as a fly. Uh, there's a lot of people I've seen where they just arsenal their combo card or something and then just pass back because they're afraid that Phi gets to fix their hand um, to basically like deal more damage going second, which is a not real thing in like CC and all those other formats. But in this format, because a lot of Phi's commons that you want to be playing only block for two. You do want to put the just the, the you know you want to press the gas pedal all the way down and hit them as hard as you can on the first turn. Obviously, if your hand's four blues and can't do damage, it might be a little bit different. But in if you have like a, a decent hand that can generate 14 damage. If their hand happened to only block for eight, you can get six damage through on turn one if um, if you just go all the way in. And obviously that's not ideal because they get to draw back up, but being able to try and, and essentially lessen the blow for your blocking turn uh, going first, it's a pretty big deal. And I think I had a game once where my f opponent was playing a Phoenix Flame in their deck and they happened to open on their opening hand. And because of that, now that Phoenix Flame, even if you pitch it for a Quell, it only blocks for one. And the rest of the hand only blocked for two. So they only had seven block in their hand and I got to deal eight damage through on the first turn. And I actually just won the game just through that where they just couldn't come back of like, they hit me on their, they went second so they got to hit me. I just didn't block, and I just presented 12 damage again next turn, and now they, they're they on the back foot. So I think the main point I just want to get here is just if you if you are forced to go first, you have to try and rip all their cards out of their hand and sneak in damage, and Fi is very efficient at doing damage, so don't be afraid to attack. Yeah, definitely echoing what Jay is saying. Um, even if it's just like leaking one or two damage, it's pretty good. Um, if it's like giving up your arsenal to leak one or two damage, like maybe not so good. But but yeah, generally trying to leak some damage is, is quite strong. Um, one thing that I do see a number of players talking about is the idea of like playing particularly red healing bomb when going first. Um I guess my personal thoughts on this is that it is okay, like having the upside of being able to go to 23 um, going first is like pretty nice. Sometimes I can give you just like the extra buffer you need to have like one more turn to attack them with a full hand. Um, but outside of that, it's like it's like kind of like a three block that you can only block with in a sense, right? Um, like you do your turn and then you end on it and then it's like a three block that, except yeah, their only option is to block with it. It doesn't do anything else. Um, so it's it's not it's not fantastic. Um, if I have some like not so good cards in my deck or my deck's like a little bit weaker, I might bring in like a healing bomb going first or something. But if my deck's like very strong and I'm really happy and I have like lots of like strong cards, I wouldn't be cutting strong cards for it. But that's kind of my thoughts. What do you think, Jay? Yeah, I think uh, if you can always open Red Healing Bomb going first, it's 100% of the time worth it. But that's not the case. Uh, you may draw it on the turn where you need to put pressure on your opponent, and uh, he gating three life might just not do anything, essentially. So I think there's like a little bit of that liability of um, if you draw it late, it might kill you. So I am not that big of a fan of it. But that said, if your deck is, if you think your deck is worse than your opponent's Phi deck in efficiency or damage output, uh, that might be your out. Like that might be your only out to play Red Healing Bomb, so you can draw it on turn one and gain the three to go up to twenty three. And if that's your out, and that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. Yeah, for sure. And in terms of the the Phi the Phi hands and their block value. Um, like just very last thing, knowing how many fives were in the pod, if you can figure that out, if you can like ask around and figure that out, that can sometimes kind of swing 
swing things a little bit. Like if you know there's five Fies in the pod, a lot of them are probably playing three Phoenix Flames. And then the chances of them just drawing one in their opening hand is like actually very real when you're thinking about how much damage you're presenting. So like the the more spread thin the five Fies are, the the their hands can block really poorly. And um, even though this is an episode on Phi, if you're playing Dromai into Phi, I would keep that in mind going first too, that sometimes just hitting him really hard um, might actually be pretty good. Like if you can do the Senapai into Senapai and Arsenal a good card, it's probably like pushing quite a bit of damage against Phi. Yeah, I agree with that. Like Phi's weakness right now in this current meta where people are draft there's like five Phi drafters in a pod is to hit them hard because they're playing either Bobbles or Phoenix Flames. Okay, uh, I think um, there's not too much else to talk about, Fi. It's like a classic aggro matchup where you're just hitting each other. Most of your cards don't block, so hopefully you win the race. Uh, anything else you want to add in this Fi mirror before we move on? Let's just really quickly talk about the uh, the kind of like critical life thresholds for Fi where you might have to start blocking. Um my opinion is like very easy for Phi to do 12 damage consistently. So if you're at 12, I would expect a block for sure. And honestly, like maybe like 17, 16, um, not unreasonable for Phi to do. So if I'm at 16, I'm like, I'm feeling like pretty good. Like they need a they need an above average turn for sure for to, to rip cards from me. But it's possible they, they might force one card from my hand. It, it wouldn't be outrageous, maybe even two, honestly. Like, I've seen 20 damage five turns. So, yeah, the matchup is, like, very explosive. And honestly, because you can't block, um, it can be it can be kind of tough. And, and that's sort of, like, why the, the first person to strike has such a big advantage, because then you're just, you hit them once, and then you're presenting lethal on the next turn. So, yeah. Yeah, just classic aggro no block format. <laughs> yeah, over in two turns, or somebody has to start blocking in two turns, like pretty consistently. Okay, then now let's uh, move on to the deck outline. Uh, what kind of cards, or how many reds, how many yellows, how many blues? Like, what is what is what should my decks look like? Yeah, so. Because your Ember Blade is so good and you have some starters that cost resources, you really want to have like a blue in every single hand. Just like always being able to turn your blue into Ember Blade plus Phoenix Flame at worst is like really, really strong, right? It's like a four for zero for free. That doesn't even cost you a card. So you, you actively want blues. They're super good. And you probably want about like eight to 10 of them. Um, I play like nine pretty happily in most decks and like maybe up to 10 if your deck's particularly expensive. Um, you probably want three blocks as much as possible. So if you draw multiple blues, you can just block with one of them for three. Um, so that's those are cards like Sif, Cinderskin, Devotion, Lava Vein, Loyalty, Critical Strike. Um, if you can't get three blocks, the zero cost Go Gun starters are also okay because at least they help your the consistency of your deck. Um, you can you can always start a turn. Um, the cards you really don't want are like the healing bombs and the sigil of protections that block two and don't start your turn. Th those cards are not ideal, but you'll play them for the strip if you have to. Yeah, you really don't want to go under like six blues is not where you want to be with a uh, five. Just because when you only have yellows, that means you are so reliant on the zero cost starters. Uh, to be able to use Ember 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 Maw every turn, and when you get to that point in your deck where you're scrapping for blues, it's gonna be tough. Like any hand where you don't have a blue, it's just red, 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 yellow. Um, unless they're all zero cost, uh, you're gonna have a little bit of a lower damage out per turn. Where if that one yellow it was a blue, you could be doing three or four more damage easily. So. I think what's just important is to make sure during the draft process when you are reviewing your packs to make sure that you have like three blues that you're happy to play after pack one, at least three more blues in pack two, and at least, you know, round it off on the third pack, three blues. And that's typically how I draft um, Uprising is 
I aim for about three when I'm drafting five. I mean, I aim for about three blues per pack uh, that I'm happy to play. So the three block blues. Yeah, and if there's like really really premium, like you're just seeing lots of really good five cards, you can prioritize them a little bit early. Like you're just seeing like a lot of premium red starters and like blaze headlongs and stuff. Um, then yeah, you can prioritize those over blues and go like a little bit low. Like sometimes I'll. I'll do my count. I'll be like, I have four blues at the end of pack two. And all that that means is because I've gotten so many powerful cards from my deck already, I need to aggressively take some blues and not just wait until the end of the pack and risk getting cut out of them. I need to spend some real picks getting those blues. And, and that's just the trade-off that I made. But if they're for premium enough cards, it's there's no problem with doing that. Um, okay, so outside of blues, you also want basically as many red go again starters as you can um especially the three and one cost ones like we said earlier because they fit in with ember blade um the yellows are fine but not um not as desirable um the zero cost ones in particular are quite nice because they still hit for two whereas like the break point of three for one cost is is not not great but it's okay um the twos the the four for twos are they they at least hit a break point so i think they're a little bit better than the three for ones sort of actually maybe not even maybe not even because of ember it, blade yeah, yeah it costs a little bit too much i think uh i would i would stay away from the yellow two costs Pro- probably just the yellow zero costs are okay but if you can help it yeah you want to stay away from the uh the two cost yellows and then finally, we have our chain enders. Um, the chain enders are, I think, kind of optional. Like we said, um, your deck doesn't have to have chain enders to be good, but it does give you a decent amount of um, punch to your deck. It makes your ceiling a little bit higher, which can matter a lot, especially in the mirror. I think that just like being able to present, if you do have to go first and your deck is able to present like 20 plus damage, um, that's a real way to win a game. Um, so I kind of like having, you know, I, I do like having a couple of these, but they're not super high picks necessarily. Yeah. It's like, if you don't see a card, like if you don't, if you're picking over, you want to pick these over like your yellow, like your yellow cards. Um, if you already have like five or six blues in pack two, you should be picking these up over a blue, uh, because you can just use your pack three higher picks on a blue to curve out your deck nicely. Uh, These optional cards are just good to have to go over the top of the other players in your pod. And that might be what you need to get the 3-0 finish uh, over your 2-1 finish. So these will be be pretty important in like a pro tour or like a nationals format where a 3-0 in a draft can be the difference of you top eighting and not so yeah like making having in mind what cards you've already picked and how many chain enders you have is gonna be crucial and you definitely want one and probably up to three or four of them right yeah i think three to four is pretty good maybe five if you have like really junky cards you could go up a little bit i think that um but yeah i usually like the ones that are one for fives um, or like zero or, or lava burst. Like when you start getting to the searing touches, where if you ever can't get to the rupture and it's just a three power, that's starting to feel pretty bad, especially for the one cost. Yeah, I agree with that. Just the raw one for fives are are where you want to be at. Okay, and uh, cards that are just nice to have. These are like you're looking to like tenth pick them, like end of the pack. Uh, I think the quell equipments, like the non generic ones uh, sorry the non-class ones so just like slippers or just the ones that only say quill on it these cards are nice to have uh, if you can afford picks on it but i would definitely prioritize main boardable cards over these so when you are in a draft pod with like four five five drafters you're going to be scrapping for that 30 30th playable in your main board the 29th card in your main board so sometimes it's just better to have a like a solid yellow starter than a like uh quell arms if you didn't get a heat wave you know just like 
like no other ability qual cards because you're not going to be a defensive deck like you just you need to make sure you have these starters you need to make sure you're not playing a bobble in your deck if you can what do you think yuki yeah i tend to agree i think um maybe the one exception for me is the quelling slippers are a little bit higher of a pick because essentially um like the tide flippers are great against Icelander, but against Dromai and Fi in your average deck, if you have a lot of starters, you don't really need tide flippers. It's not like you can play them; they're better than nothing. But, but I think I would actually prioritize a qual equipment over the tide flippers in that spot in the non Icelander matchups. And um, it's also just a card that, like, if it's early in the draft, goes in every deck. So. Quelling Slippers is and doesn't really have much competition. So Slippers feels like it consistently makes your deck a lot better. I think it's at its worst in Fi specifically um, compared to like Icelander or Dromai because you're not as interested in blocking. But sometimes just being able to turn like a blue two block into a blue three block, um, you know, that one life difference can be the game or or blocking like, um, you know, multiple Phoenix Flames or Ash Wings that you wouldn't be able to block otherwise. Like that, that can be a pretty big deal. So... I think the slippers is nice, but the other ones are, yeah, they're nice to have, but they're not great. The slippers is maybe higher priority because it just doesn't have as much competition. Yeah, I think uh, just like a final note on Fi in general would be try not to play a bobble. Uh, and I, at least for me personally, I do consider the third Phoenix Flame in a deck uh, essentially a bobble. So I would even try to avoid having three Phoenix Flames in your deck. Uh, the Phoenix Flame not having a block value can be a liability in almost all three matchups. Like the red pitch against Icelander is not great. Um, the zero block against uh, Droma is not good. And just being just drawing a Phoenix Flame in the five mirror uh, can lower your damage up but so much that the third Phoenix Flame is not typically where you want to be. Uh, obviously, unless you have like five or six seven cars that care about having multiple phoenix flames but that's not gonna happen that often so yeah unless you have a strong reason to play three phoenix flames i would avoid it and try and play essentially like even just a zero like a blue sorry a blue head jab is better just because it pitches for three and it blocks for two or and, and it still attacks for one, as Phoenix Flame would, so I would just prioritize that over the third Phoenix Flame. Yeah. Even, even like, your junky, like, you, like, your cards that you might think aren't great, like your yellow Critical Strike or your yellow Brother in Arms, like, those cards are just fine. They're, they're, not, they're not exciting, they're not great, but, like, they're okay, and I think they're better than a Phoenix Flame on average in your deck, especially because they pitch for Ember Blade in a pinch. Yeah, I think Phoenix Flame only pitching for the red is it can it can it can cause a lot of problems. And sometimes when you have to use a Phoenix Flame as a starter, that's like a easy way to lose or lose tempo of the game. So yeah, if you are just automatically right including Phoenix Flame right now, you should probably avoid that and try and look for or try and build Fire decks with one Phoenix Flame so you can start in your graveyard if you don't have any Flame Call Awakenings, which is the one that searches the uh, Phoenix Flame from your deck. Um, if you can avoid that, like you should avoid it, I think. Um, no Phoenix Flame in decks typically is a more powerful Fire deck. Uh, anything else you want to add for this episode, Yuki? Um, yeah, I had sort of like one general question that for you that came up at the start. Um, we were talking about how Phi is usually very highly contested in a pod. There's um, typically like three to five Phi's. And because you know that you're going to be competing for cards, how do you evaluate whether you want to like commit to Phi and just like try and get it, even though you know some players are taking it, or you're actually getting cut out of it and you're going to have a bad time if you draw Phi? How do you like distinguish that, or like where's the line for you between those two? For me, I generally go into a draft defaulting as a Phi, just because Phi's 
floor is so high that even if you have like the worst Phi deck, I think you're still better than the the worst Dromai or the worst Icelander decks. And I think that is enough for me to like be be on Phi. So like it's very hard to have a Phi deck that goes one and two essentially in a draft. Like obviously it's, it is gonna happen if you have like the super super junky Phi decks uh, that's playing like a cracked bubble uh or multiple cracked bubbles but i think in general because so many of the cards are replaceable and it's just so hard to get cut out of five even if you're sitting directly next to another five player they're getting the slightly more premium versions of your cards but like all the cards are serviceable and they're all replaceable with each other that it's going to be you're going to end up okay like it's it's unfortunate to say, but like you can just force Fi and you have a 2-1 deck almost every time. So if you're not confident in drafting the other two heroes or you don't know how to get the premium versions of the other two heroes, just having your head locked into Fi, I think, is an okay strategy. Like it's it's gonna get you wins. Maybe not like maybe not the 3-0 that you're looking for, but it'll at least get you one, maybe two wins in the format. Yeah, I think I agree with um, with all of that, but just um, maybe adding on that it's it's kind of interesting because I think I actually navigate a little bit of the opposite way, where unless there's like a really strong fi card early, like maybe like a mounting anger or like a blaze headlong, um, this kind of like super premium cards, I might dip into fi early, um, or like a Sasha Sandakai, like those are the kind of cards that like make me lean Fi. And if I have those, and I have like a couple strong Fi picks, it's very hard for me to get four stuff off of Fi at that point. Uh, kind of like Jay said, like you can kind of just force it. Um, it's just that, like even if you wind up with other mediocre cards, like your your deck's just going to be pretty good. Um, that being said, I often like starting out. Um, either kind of like open between a few heroes or even like my favorite way of staying open is probably drafting like an Icelander start or a Dromai start. And then if I feel like I'm starting to get cut, I can start looking for uh, for five cards because because of the Phoenix Flames, you, you, you actually don't have to, like if you draft 27 cards, yeah, you don't want the th- third phoenix flame but it's like totally fine so i find Fi kind of like the easier deck to pivot into and so I'll often if there's like a you know the premium like aether ice vein or like a premium dragon in dromai i might be inclined to start with that just because it's like i can always default back to Fi if i start seeing some some three for zeros or something like that but yeah typically like if I'm already in Fi and I have strong cards, the only way I would move off of it is if something else is like incredibly open and I'm getting cut very hard. Like if I'm just not seeing good Fi cards and I'm just getting past like like a rake the embers or something, I'll be like, okay, sure, I'll switch. But but outside of that, like I'll I'll dig my heels in pretty hard if I have the the good Fi start. Okay. Um So I think that concludes this week's episode of On the Bobble. You can find us on YouTube and Spotify, um, but we'll also be looking to add other platforms. And if you have feedback about a platform that you would like to to find us on, uh, please message us um, at our email, uh, onthebobble at gmail.com, or um, you can message me on Twitter uh, at Yuki Lee Bender. So you you can tweet at me. Um, if you want other content that I'm involved with, I write articles for Red Riot Games, although my last article was a little bit away, it was a ways ago now. It's been a little while, but I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, yeah. So thanks so much for listening. Please like, comment, and subscribe, um, and help us get that subscriber count up so that we're searchable on YouTube. Yeah, I think right now we're at a 77 subscriber, so let's try and hit the 100 mark. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, But yeah, that concludes the pod for this week, and uh, goodbye for now. Well, sign off. Yes, sign off. Always sign off. What to talk about today, Yuki? Do you have anything in mind? Do you want me to tell my story about 
signing the um the gold foil new horizon <laughs> oh i yes 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 let's talk about the gold foil new horizon okay yeah go ahead yuki tell, tell me this story i don't even know where it started or where it was at so um just a story from the calling new jersey that i think i'll remember for a long time is um or sorry, not the calling, the, the pro tour in New Jersey. The, there was also the calling, but I was playing in the pro tour. And um, it was sort of, I think after day two, especially day one, day one as well, but especially day two, um, people were like very, very excited about the Lexi deck. I had been on, I had been on feature match three times already. Um, and, and people were like very, very focused on that deck. And when I tried to leave the venue on day two, um, at the end of day two, I actually took almost like an hour to get out of the venue because so many people were talking to me um, and just saying hi, which was like really cool to meet people, but also just like, I'm very tired. I just played <laughs> like the like the rest of the Pro Tour, like so 14 rounds of Swiss over the last two days. I'm exhausted. Um, but anyways, at one point, um, a few people were asking me to sign some like Lexi related cards for them, which I did, and, and some playmats and stuff like that. Um, but like somebody in the middle of it just like was like, "Oh, can you sign this card and pass me their New Horizon?" And I went, "Okay, okay." And then I was like, picked up the the sharpie and I was about to sign it, and then I was like, "Wait a second, this is cold foil." And then I went, "Wait a second, no, it's not cold foil. It, it's actually gold foil." And then I, I looked at the guy. And I'm like. Are you serious? Like, are you sure you want me to sign this? Like, I'm, you know, I'm not Frederico. I don't have like a beautiful signature or anything. He's like, oh no, no, I want you to do it. So I, um, I showed him like a sample in my on my life badge. Just like, this is what my signature is like. And he went, okay, um, and he just insisted. He really wanted it, and that was just like one of the crazier things to have somebody ask me to uh, to sign that. So that was a memorable moment for me and. Uh, I think one will, uh, will stick with me. Yeah, just a note for you guys, listeners. Uh, a gold foil uh, legendary equipment can basically be only be opened at calling top eights or pro tour top eights and national top eights. I think that's it, right? E- I think also battle hardened. If you win, I think you get a legendary. Oh, okay. yes. Oh, maybe they're, maybe they're very maybe top to two. Yeah, maybe top two in Battle Hardened. Uh, well, it's top two get an invite, and then winner gets gold foil. And I believe it's a legendary, but I could be wrong. I think it's a legendary for Battle Okay, Hardened. well, either way, it's super hard to come by these gold foils, and there's not that many out there. And one of them is signed by Yuki Lee Bender, the legendary <laughs> Lexi player. <laughs> well... Okay, I think that was a good story. Um, yeah, and uh, if you guys uh, ever see Yuki at like, the next Pro Tour or something, you should go bother her and get her to send some nice legendaries again. Well, good night, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>